Welcome to SpaceCast. I'm Josh. I'm here again with Bob. He's joined us for the last few episodes, and he's going to talk to us again about some more space activity that he has seen as the Director of Operations for the Commercial Space Operations Center. Again, Comspock, repeating for the people that have seen the other ones, but the Comspock has a global network of sensors, and they are watching everything in space, uh, particularly the geo belt, and they're doing uh, orbit determination, watching for maneuvers, looking for close approaches. They are maintaining a catalog, and so Bob is with us today to talk about another thing that he saw last summer. Welcome back, Bob. Thanks, Josh. And uh, today you're going to talk about something you saw last last July time frame? Yep. So I kind of gave it away with the title here, but uh, we'll go through the details. Uh, this is something interesting we saw uh, involved China Sat 1C and another satellite um, last July. Uh, so <clears throat> China Sat 1C is a comm satellite, and it says your words. It's Who owns it? it? It's a China. Oh, okay. Just making sure. <laughs> um, and last July, uh, I'm jumping ahead to my conclusion. It experienced an anomaly. So, uh, what we and this is this was all contemporaneous. Uh, this is not like weeks and months later. We we watched this unfold. Um, on July 11th, uh, it had a few maneuvers that were out of family. So, as I said, we, based on our um, our extended common filter OD technology, which is, which is uh, unequal. The, the realistic covariance and the ability to, to, to process orbit data that way that lets us uh, do uh, maneuver processing, again, in an unequaled way. And not only do I do the maneuver processing and characterization, I can then build up patterns of life. And what we saw were there were two maneuvers on this guy on July 11th that were abnormal for this guy. Um, and, and so that was what, what triggered it for us. We mm -hmm. said, that's, that's weird. Um, and I, I'm talking about maneuvers. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about strictly from the sense of an orbit analyst, meaning something happened to perturb the orbit. Um, I don't mean it to say, you know, intentional action by the operator to move their spacecraft. I mean, the orbit changed because of some reason. So, so delta V was applied to the... Delta V was yep. applied somehow. You know, somebody smacked it. No, that didn't happen. But but something happened. Sure. <clears throat> so the uh, size of the in-track maneuver was three to four times larger than what was typical for the satellite. Um, and there was also a cross-track component that was unusual. So that was weird. Um, and then we also have what uh, photometry. Photometry is where we look at the light curve data that the telescopes can measure. And essentially, it's a way for us to assess stability and we saw something unusual at the same time. There was a period on July 11th, right around the time of one of these maneuvers, where it was unstable. So what do I mean? Well, first of all, uh, I want to show you a, a capability we were developing for this. Uh, this is a, a little bit of an eye chart, hard to understand. Um, but what you're looking at here, imagine there's a geosatellite. Most geosatellites are like a, a box, a cubish thing, with two large wings, two large solar rays. Generally speaking, the box faces the Earth 24-7. The solar rays rotate to follow the sun. And so you get this every night, this rise in brightness and then this drop off. This rise in brightness and this drop off. From the solar panels. Uh, yes. And think of this plot as left to right, it says up top, is a solar phase angle. So that is the time of night as the sun goes left to right. Uh, imagine you're, you're on a ground station, a telescope on the Earth, looking up at the satellite, and the sun is going behind us. Uh, and so you're seeing, uh, it's like a flashlight hitting a satellite, the flashlight's moving, so you're seeing different reflections of the satellite. That's the one axis. The other axis is the time of year, the sun declination or out of plane angle. And so what will happen is if you look at one of these things over the course of the year, over the course of the night, it ought to form a fairly repeatable pattern based on the surfaces of the satellite. And so we can look for something that doesn't match the pattern. Now it turns out uh, at the time this happened, I didn't have a fully fleshed out map for this guy. So you see a lot of blanks. Um, and the, So the white space is just no data. Right, I didn't have a chance to do that because um, we had only started doing this. Uh, and then the color scale is on the right. That's the visual magnitude. So the the warmer, sorry, the bluer the color, the dimmer the object, the dimmer the, the, the reflection, if you will. 
And the, the day that I saw the, the time of the anomaly is circled in the lower right, where it's all the way off on the bottom of the curve there. Uh, if you wanted to see it in black, that's what it looks like. So here's, here it is zoomed in. Uh, now, we're not staring at the satellite all the time. So this is uh, an acquired skill. I don't expect you to necessarily uh, see what my eyes see in, in, in two minutes. But every night, I see a nice up and down curve with this guy. Every night, a nice up and down curve. You're, you're, what are you motioning to, the purple? The, the up and down. The, the different colors are just different sensors. Okay. Uh, but I see a nice up and down curve. Those are observations? Those this dots? is the brightness of the object as it gets brighter and dimmer over the course of the night. What does each individual dot represent? The visual, visual magnitude? At an, an, an individual image, if you will. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now I've zoomed in on this. At the lower left is a zoom in of this. Um, and this particular pass that I've highlighted is a pretty wide uh, variance or standard deviation over a short period of time. So normally I see this nice, gentle up and down over the course of night. This, you can see, was uh, varying, the brightness was varying somewhat wildly over a short time frame. At the same time, uh, these, these blue lines, by the way, these vertical lines, mm -hmm. are maneuvers that our software solve for. So at the same time that we detected a change to the orbit, we see the satellite was unstable. So uh, based on my satellite operations experience, one of two things happened. Uh, most likely is they had an anomaly and they used their thrusters to help regain their attitude. Those thrusters induced a change to the orbit. And then you see the very next night, they were kind of like back on the regular curve and they were stable again. So it was very brief. But something happened. So the, the, go back to that for just a second. The time between the maneuver, the, the one. This one and here, you just weren't watching him here. Right, right. Again, because of our network and other things, we, we weren't staring at everybody so all the time. So you could have had an anomaly here. Uh, could have been. And uh, then, but you sure. saw it here. Yes, it, it's, yes, it's possible it was, was going on here, but I, I don't want to say that. I can't say. I can say I caught it here, and by here it was fixed. And that would be consistent with them using thrusters to kind of get their satellite oriented the right way. Or something happened with the thrusters that caused it to lose attitude that induced a change. And However, they, they restabilized. So as a result of these maneuvers, the satellite began to drift to the west at 05 degrees a day. 05 degrees a day is not, you know, screaming across the sky. But within a day or two, you're out of your box. You're out of your home. So it continued to drift. So this was July 11th. Uh, by July 18th, SJ-17 did something. So SJ-17 was initially about 13 degrees away on the geo belt. Turns out it was inclined four degrees, so it was going up and down four degrees. Uh, actually, and can actually you, eight degrees. And SJ-17 is a highly maneuverable. Can you give a little it, bit it's, about it's a it's a Chinese um, it's an object of great interest to us. It's a it's a it's a test. Uh, object. And okay. we've seen it move quite a bit in the oh, past. Oh yeah, we've seen we'll it do that uh, in another. There's all kinds of delta v as they execute uh, rendezvous and prox ops tests with other Chinese objects. and That's a whole other discussion to talk yeah, about SJ-17. It's an experimental satellite with different payloads they're testing out. So, so he came over, is what you're saying. He came over. He, he maneuvered to begin drifting at four degrees a day. So that's, that's a pretty high drift rate to go four degrees a day. When that, I mean, that caught our attention. Like, where's he going? Um, so three days later, because we're only talking about 12 or 13 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, he got there. It removed the four degrees of inclination. So while four degrees a day is a lot of delta V east-west-wise, that's nothing compared to the fuel required to kill four degrees of inclination. Changing your plane is very expensive fuel-wise. Uh, that It costs a lot of fuel. So they did both of those things. Um, they were in a hurry to get over there. On 21 July, they completed their rendezvous. And it looked like this. So SJ, so China Sat, if you if you could see, here's the box where they were hanging out. They had drifted out of their box over the course of a week, and SJ-17 was just off screen, going up and down four degrees, actually uh, eight degrees, up four, down four, um, and came racing over at four degrees a day, and killed their inclination and killed their drift rate to rendezvous with China Sat 1C. Is that an image or a video? This is still okay. So then SJ-17 stayed about 10 kilometers west of Chinasat 1C for quite a while. So Chinasat 1C continued to drift with the drift rate it had, and SJ-17 was kind of like riding along with it. 
So they did a rendezvous with it. They were doing prox hops. And on the 29th of July, they actually did a circumnav where they went around it, and they got as close as one and a half kilometers. Was that hard to detect when they went around N- it? No, we, we could detect it. Again, because of our maneuver capabilities, we, we could figure that out, no problem. Uh, they kept drifting for 10 more days. The, uh, the, my best guess is that SJ-17 was looking at trying to set one suit. Um, they, the closest we saw them get was one and a half kilometers. It, there was no, you know, reach out and touch somebody. There's none of that right. stuff. Um, but the only explanation for this thing racing over here and parking and sitting there for, you know, n number of days before any action was taken is they must have been trying to look at it uh, because then eventually on August 1st, they fire thrusters on China Set 1C to slow down the drift. So August 1st and 2nd, they killed the drift rate, okay? Uh, and then on 2, 3, and 4 August, they started drifting it back towards home. SJ-17 did the same thing and basically stayed with it. So it stopped and went, went back with it. Uh, all the way through about August 14th. So in other words, 10 more days into the homeward drift, and then SJ-17 departed and went back to where it came from. And, and Transat 1C eventually got back home on September 7th. Um, so here's the circumnav on the 29th of July. So you can see uh, what you're seeing here is the China Sat is drawn in an earth fixed frame. I've drawn SJ-17 in a frame relative to where China Sat is. So for this day or so, they were parked in a pretty tight, you know, about 10-ish kilometers west of China Sat. And then on the 29th, they did this kind of loop around. Ah, this, this loop around. Mm-hmm. Uh, so relative to China Sat, they did a loop. Got as close as one and a half kilometers. This is a, a uh, plot of the longitude of the two. So here's, here's uh, on this page, this, this is China Sat 1C. The anomaly happens on July 11th. They start drifting. So this chart is longitude. T- time. Time on the, the bottom. The x-axis. Longitude. Longitude up and down. Yes, yes. So... Normally happens, Transat 1C starts sliding to the west at a slow rate. Uh, seven days later, they send SJ-17 racing over at four degrees a day, one, two, three, boom. Rendezvous with it, uh, park just west of it, and do whatever they came there for. Again, my speculation is some kind of observation. And after about a week or so, they kill the drift rate and turn around, and the two, again, stay in lockstep. Here it is zoomed in kill the drift rate, turn around, and they stay together, stay together. And by this point, I guess they declare success, and SJ-17 heads home. This guy takes another several weeks to get home to where he started. So we use our commercial data to identify there was an unusual event, uh, what has all the appearances of an anomaly. Uh, We we could look into their investigation a little bit to the sense that sending SJ-17 over to do something as part of their investigation, they... Whatever happened, they seemed reluctant to fire the thrusters on China Set 1C until they had SJ-17 there for a while. Mm -hmm. So again, putting two and two together, they have some sort of observational capability. Now, it has performed a lot of RPOs, rendezvous and proxos missions. So that would strongly suggest it's got decent cameras to do a rendezvous and proxos. SJ-17 has performed a lot. So logical conclusion is they went over to use those cameras to look at this guy and can I see for some reason they were concerned is there some sort of physical damage I don't know right but he, he got close but probably not close enough to do any sort of onboard no 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 well, the closest we saw was one and a half kilometers okay so but they, that's yeah. still relatively close yeah but not so so like you said not touching close right so our our conclusion is that there was an anomaly on July 11th they used thruster firings to correct the uh, the attitude uh and that probably induced a drift we saw a similar thing with AMC-9 back in 2017, where that, that happens. Um, we thought it was an interesting use of SJ-17 as an observer. So SJ-17, again, has done at least three other different rendezvous and prox ops uh, submissions, all against Chinese objects. This one appeared to be uh, spontaneous or, or unplanned. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, So that was what was interesting. It was an unplanned use of this as, a, as an investigator. Um, and again, they... They appeared to put any recovery actions on hold until they could verify. Look at it. I don't know. Yep. So fascinating was, stuff. Yep. Well, thank you, Bob, very much for being here. I think that people would probably be interested in you coming back and talking a little bit more about SJ17 at some point when we have time for that. 
Right. Um, there's probably a few other things that are interesting that you have seen in your time up there that are worth mentioning that not everyone out there would know is going on. And so we look forward to hearing more uh, space activity reports, so to speak, from you, uh, All right. from the comp Spock. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. And uh, what's, what's your favorite space movie? <laughs> um, that's a tough one. Apollo 13 is the leading contender of everybody that's been on so far. Apollo 13 was a great movie. Yeah. It was a great movie. Uh, you're a steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, that's, that's all we got. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you.